Welcome back, episode two of Grace Harbor Farms. We've got a lot more great content, great questions being asked for Tim, Grace, and David who are running this place. They're doing a great job, so stay tuned with us. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell, comment below. We need your engagement. We wanna succeed in this channel. We want you to succeed in all that you're doing as well. Our business went down like 60% in a day, you know, just like this, and we had to declare bankruptcy. Uh, 150 grand. That's a good month, it'd be a good month. I went down to the community food co-op in Bellingham. I found the highest priced organic yogurt on the shelf and I priced ours 10% higher. We went into cheese about the same time that we left the malls. We started making cheese and people wanted bottled milk, so we bottled milk. And then our customers wanted raw milk. Now we're really fortunate in Washington state that raw milk is legal and the Washington State Department of agriculture. WSDA. Well, yeah, they will help you. So the customers were just begging for raw milk. So again, Tim resisted for a year or so, but he finally said, okay, let's just go for this and try it. And the world went crazy. We had the second raw milk license, second active raw milk license in Washington state. And we were the first one to take it into the marketplace. Yeah. So we took in goat milk. We were, were milking six goats or something when yeah, we started, so. just a tiny little business. Tim would take the milk down to Seattle, to Whole Foods and places like that. And the, the, the people meeting him at the docks would say, oh, they're circling in the very department it waiting was... for you. We had a guy that flew his private airplane from Seattle up to Bellingham to get the raw milk. We had people arriving on their bicycles. I mean, whatever. I mean, it was just the world <laughs> was, was crazy. Pretty... And they're begging, begging, begging for more. By that time, we moved onto this property. People begged for cow's milk raw. Well, once you have a raw milk license, you could milk a camel if you can figure out how to get it into your milking parlor. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we went ahead and got some cows. And before too long, we're milking 70 goats and 15 cows on this property. And the world's going crazy for our milk. you are a commercial dairyman, it is a hard business because in this area, unless you go independent, the only option is to sell to a co-op and they set the price. So for mm -hmm. example, you get hired onto the company, sign a contract and they say, I'm going to pay you 20 bucks an hour. And then two weeks go by, they're like, Hey, just kidding. I'm going to pay you 10 bucks an hour. Hope that's, you're good with that. Yeah, that's a surprise. You can't really do anything about it. Nope. And that's the, that's the milk market. They have no control over the price they're paid. Their costs are going up generally, not down, unless mm -hmm. maybe fuel prices go down, but their milk prices are fluctuating constantly. Yeah. Right? Now you guys are not impacted by that. Correct. Yeah, we are independent. So we're impacted by some of it. I mean, just normal economic gas prices, insurance, all right. that sort of stuff. But with milk prices, it's basically a fixed rate that we can, you know, either produce it for and or pay for some of the milk if we need it. Um, versus those guys that is constantly in flux. What are the biggest expenses of operating a farm today? And really in general, what are the major expenses of operating a farm in its entirety? Biggest expenses today would be number one, labor. I mean, just from a itemized, you know, category, which is great. I love employing people. Um, but I mean, with, Beyond just that, it's just cost of goods. I mean, you got your money into packaging, you got diesel to run the trucks, you know, I mean, our operation is not grand and huge and glorious, but we're, we're a multi-million dollar company. So by the time all that money rolls through the door, you want to keep some of it. The reality is you're only going to keep a couple percent. That's just, that's reality. It costs money to make food, to sell it, to truck it, to do all of it. Got to pay people decent wages, stick around, right? I mean, nobody wants to work for minimum wage. That's not what it's designed to, to do right. long term. So the big expenses now that we're starting to see is equipment. You know, I mean, refrigerated trucks are not cheap. Bottling equipment, if you want a good bottler that can do yogurt, you're talking 100 grand. You know, I mean, that stuff adds up quick. And are you doing that here? Yep. So yep. everything is packaged, including the yogurt and edibles yep. at this location. Exactly, yep. They're going to love you forever. <laughs> Did they just eat it with? Uh, oh yeah, shell on everything. Shell everything. Yep. They're gonna take my finger off too. No, nope, no. Nope. So they're pretty good about knowing. No, they're good, and 
They've only got uh, bottom teeth, so if they do get a finger, it's just a little, Hi. kind of a little pull, it's no big deal. <laughs> Sorry, that's all I had, you guys. Why don't you all subscribe to Upflip on YouTube? We need more viewers, we need more feedback. You guys would be great. Our biggest crisis was the E. coli incident. And there were two children in Seattle who got sick. They both had our milk products in their refrigerators. E. coli was never found in any of our finished products, mm -hmm. but they identified the E. coli that the children had with manure samples from here saying that that was a DNA thing and it was conclusive that it got mm -hmm. there. So we learned a whole lot about E. coli and how it develops. It was really the worst crisis of our business Two, the two children who were sick, one was hospitalized and he completely recovered, praise God. Yes. Because that doesn't always happen with E. coli. It's very dangerous. And we will, we're not gonna sell any raw products again. But I felt like I had backed over somebody with my car. Mm -hmm. It was like somebody else's child has been hurt on my learning curve. That was a and horrible it was, time. It was really bad. What did yeah. you learn and how did you get out of it uh, in, in a good, positive light? We ended up in a bankruptcy our business went down like 60% in a day, you know, just like this. Right. We tried to keep going with credit cards. Eventually, we couldn't pay the credit cards, and we had to declare bankruptcy. We, that was a long that, time ago now. That was a long time ago now, and we're back where our credit scores are perfect now again. But that bankruptcy did, did some good things for us, too, mm -hmm. because it forced us to operate on our cash. We didn't have any credit to do anything else. We had to do everything by cash. If we needed a new truck or we needed a new anything, we had to do it with money that we had. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, yeah. that was a good lesson for us. As far as getting into stores, can you share with us a little bit about how tough it was to get on store shelves? What's the story when, when sure. you first got your own space in a particular store? Yep. Um, as yeah, much yeah. as you could share with us, it'd be great. Thankfully, I, <laughs> I didn't have to grind as hard as my, my dad and stepmom did, mm -hmm. um, but they started in the farmer's market, like they said, and that was a key where people started buying it already, trying it, getting their mouths, started asking for it in the local co-ops, right? So the, uh, the store buyers are kind of the gatekeepers, but mm -hmm. the end consumer, the end customer has a ton of pull, right? So if people are coming into your store saying, hey, you don't have this product, I would like to buy it here, that's awesome. So it's opened up a ton of doors that way. Now that was 20 years ago. So now if we're dealing with Whole Foods, for example, is one of our bigger clients. It's a big company. It's an international company now. It's hard to get in there, right? So thankfully we've been in there for 20 years, but I mean, there's still a bunch of either new products we're launching or something that it either you know falls flat and flops completely, or it takes six months of, you know, hey, Here's an email. Hey, here's, you know, what do you do? Right. Hey, what do you think about this? So, so we, you've, you've been at Whole Foods for 20 years. Yes, sir. Yep. And we actually, so on that same token, we just got a product called Wacom Red in there. It's our first all fruit, non-dairy product that we started making. It took about six months from the time that I gave it to the buyer, regional buyer. She's been with Whole Foods ever since day one working with us. She's incredible. But it took them six months to get it through corporate, make sure that it's in the store planogram, where are they going to slot it? Does it actually sell? So they're watching our other clients that have it, you know, is it still slotted after three months, four months, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, make the other clients tell you if it'll sell. And so then, yeah, finally got launched and officially in there as of last week. Um, but it took six months of grinding, you know. I was influenced, greatly influenced by an article in Fortune magazine, and this was a long time ago. A guy named Branson has a little airline business, Sir Branson, Virgin Airways Airlines. He was advising people. He said, if you want to start a business, don't create something new. You don't have to go into a niche. You don't, don't create something new. Go into the marketplace and find the largest category that's profitable. Identify a niche in that, in that category that you can do and then do it better in your competition. So the key element here is this, competition is good. Mm -hmm. Competition is nothing to be afraid of. Competition is there to make you successful if you embrace that correctly. And so what I did, when we introduced, introduced our yogurt product in 2009, 
I went down to the I went down to the community food co-op in Bellingham. I found the highest priced organic yogurt on the shelf. And I priced ours 10% higher. I went in with a higher local price than competition. Most people come in and go, oh my gosh, I got to sell it for less. No, you don't. No, you don't. You knew what you had. I knew what we had. And at that point in time, I'd uh, at that point in time, we'd been into the market for oh two or three years. And the the concept that I was hearing through the buyers was traceability. People want want that they want to be able to trace their food so, food source. Mm -hmm. That's why this local movement is developing. People want to be able to know their farmer, for example. And they're willing to pay a premium price for a quality product, but you better be able to walk your talk. So in terms of profit, you know, what's, what's a good month here and what's a bad month here? Oh, um, probably holiday season is good. Everybody's baking, everybody's eating food, gathering around the table. What's that um, number look like in retail sales? Uh, 150 grand. That's a good month. Would be a good month. Yep. Um, bad month would be, I mean, 80, 90, you know, and that's where it's like getting close to like, we're, we're trying to keep the lights on, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's getting tight. Gotcha. Yep. Do the ghosts need lights too, or? They do, yeah. They need uh, <laughs> about 12 hours of daylight to go into heat and, and milk well. Vitamin D is good for them too, yeah. Get those yeah. animals outside, commercial dairy guys. Yeah, you hear that? Vitamin D is good for all of us too. That's right, there's a joke there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us your day-to-day -day tasks for you. And then how many hours a week do you work? Are you working 100 hours a week? Are you working 20 hours a week? I mean, business owners, you know, yeah. sometimes the idea is I'll work 10 and I'll go home and have fun for the rest, but. It, it depends. My main tasks consist of this. Lots of emails. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be milking. Uh, thankfully not anymore, um, <laughs> but it did. So main tasks, honestly, it is it is email, it is personal management, it's all that. Um, kind of just being an on-site manager per se. Um, Hour wise, I mean, a good week is 50 hours, you know, 40 to 50 is, would be awesome. Yeah. Um, it all depends, man. Sometimes there's the 100 hour weeks, but I mean, that's not sustainable for very long. Yeah, so. yeah, we just had a guest walk in. What's, yeah. what's her name? <laughs> that would be Jules. Jules? Jules the goat. Jules the goat. <laughs> uh, Jules, we have a couple questions for you. What's it like living at Grace Harbor Farms? Are they taking care of you well? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> How much milk are you producing? Are you meeting your quotas? She is, yeah. You She's are? doing good. Good for you. Good for you. Can I pet you? Wow. Why do some small farms fail? Number one failure is not having an idea of where you're going to market your products. That's number one. Number two is not knowing what your costs are. Mm -hmm. Because you got if if you have no idea where you're going to sell it and 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 at least some basic concept of that, um, I've seen people and heard of people invest a lot of money in infrastructure, thinking, well, gosh, everybody's going to want it. Well, guess what? That's not the case. There's a lot of competition out there, and timing is a timing is huge. And but if, as we go into the next stage, and 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 Lord willing, we. We do a, a, a retirement gig with the B and B and a and a little goat operation and so forth. Paramount is what's the market potential and what's it cost us to operate. And and the big the big question mark at this point in in, in what's happening to us through this COVID thing mm -hmm. is what's the new normal going to look like? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what people are going to do now after they've ex had this experience. So that'll be an interesting study in regards to deciding. Um, what are people going to do now? Are you thinking of expanding into different markets? If so, how? New products? If so, how? Mm -hmm. Love to hear what you're thinking in for sure. terms of long term. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, the main thing right now is the baton pass, right? I'm, I'm working on buying the property from the parents, making sure it's sustainable, and, and it is. Um, I do want to grow in other markets, not necessarily further, further out markets. 
Mm -hmm. Every single person that eats food is a potential customer, right? So Wes Herman told me once, um, own your own backyard, right? I mean, he's Woods Coffee, right? So he's done a great job of starting this little micro coffee stand. And I mean, they're everywhere now. They're doing great. It's a family run company. They've really set the bar, own your own backyard. So that's part of my goals, right? I mean, whether it's different products, maybe different, um, I don't know, maybe it's not dairy, maybe it's not a fruit smoothie, maybe it's something else. I'm not sure. But I got the networks created already. I've got great employees. I've got the food licenses. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity there, I'd say. Yeah, as long as we keep, we keep eating, yep. That yep. that's a potential business and, opportunity for you and the farm. And that's pretty secure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like the, I like the yogurt with uh, the cream on top. There you, you know? go. Yep. You guys have that? Yeah, we do. That's like us. actual cream on top. Yes, you got to scoop that before yep. you get to the actual yogurt. That's all that we do. We do yeah. minimally processed cream top. That's exactly what you get. That's delicious. I'm going to have to finish this episode here and run over to the grocery store. Oh, man. I, yeah. I know a guy. We'll hook you up. <laughs> Uplift started a blog, and we want you guys to look in the descriptions below for that link. Our goal for that is... There's so many questions we can ask. We can't ask all of it in a 20, 30 minute episode, but we wanna do that further in the blog. So please take a look, uh, ask more questions so that they can be answered in a more detailed way uh, in that new tool that we're creating for you guys. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for subscribing. We appreciate you. We're grateful for you and uh, stay tuned for more episodes. Take care.